Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you, we everyone. Mark, we live. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming today and showing interest in our talk. Well, the, the title of the talk suggests that we will be talking about transformation at the transport industry. And transformation is one of the main concepts inside Minsight's philosophy. I just want to show you a video in order to introdu introduce this concept. <clears throat> we are the mark we leave the sign of our commitment to the future. A commitment that evolves and stays in motions as days and times change. Leaving our mark on people, in companies, in society, is our motivation, because we are the mark we wish to leave. Because revolutionizing business, we revolutionize our world. A more sustainable, more human, more intelligent and secure world. We believe that in any field, the important thing is to innovate and transform, to create advanced products and services, promote a better society and increase the quality of life. Through our own solutions, innovative services and state-of-the-art technologies, we contribute to the creation of the companies and institutions of the future. We want to be your companions on this journey, full of unexplored routes, creating new ways of doing and living and developing new businesses driven by technological innovation. Working together from start to finish, from ideation to implementation, through agile and collaborative cultures. New methodologies that change the rules of the game. But a trip without companions would be nothing and we know it. That is why we believe in people, in empowering their talent, in the sum of diverse intelligences united by common values. We are committed, curious, non-conformist people, collaborating for a common purpose. A better world for future generations. Welcome to the human technological revolution. Welcome to Minsight. Okay, so the experience that we are sharing with you today has a lot to do with this positive and human impact on society. Uh, because transport, maybe with uh, communications or energy industries, are one of the uh, industries that has had a highest impact on society in the past 20 years. <clears throat> transport is something that affects us all, regardless our company is just focused on transport. Uh, goods or people or we're a company that uses transport just as a, a means of connecting our products with our final clients. Or even if we are a regular citizen that uses private or public means of transport to go to work or visit some friends or family around your town. And just to give you some numbers, transport industry generates 15% of the gross domestic product in the whole world. So you can imagine the economical impact that this industry has. And only in Europe, there are more than 10 million employees which are associated to this industry. <clears throat> if you take a look at the budget in the mean average budget in European houses, 13% of this budget is dedicated to transportation issues. And also for people or just products, we all we traverse and we travel through thousands of billions of kilometers every year. <clears throat> but this industry has also a huge impact on the environment. 25% of greenhouse emissions are associated to this industry. And if we go to the data plane, you, you can imagine the amount of rich data that this industry can generate. Sensoric information and the Internet of Things, connected vehicles, uh, interaction through social networks and webs, etc. No? Some studies have stated that the efficiency of transport industry and the uh, emissions that this in industry generates can be reduced and improved in a 15% amount just to the, through the use of big data analytics. However, those studies also show that only 19% of transport companies employ big data and advanced analytic technologies. And what's more, 70% of those transport companies do not plan to use it in, in a near future. 
So in this great opportunity scenario, the European Union decided to fund a set of initiatives in order to prove the viability and positive impact that uh, big data and uh, in artificial intelligence can have on transport industry. The goal of the project was to act as a catalyzer in order to apply these state-of-the-art technologies in this digitally immature industry. And it was a complete success, as all the developments that were carried out along the project have now been integrated, and we are changing the way that these transport uh, companies are uh, operating. We are very happy that we have contributed in order to bring some light and create a continuous improvement cycle in such a relevant industry. If we take a look at the project, whose name is Transforming Transport, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a European project which is funded by the Horizon 2020 funds. Uh, and this year, uh, uh, it received an award as the best digital transformation based on data use case in Europe. This project has been developed by a consortium of 49 different partners and was led by the transport division of Indra. <coughs> Those partners represented 11 different European countries and the project has a budget of 19, uh, 19 million euros. Uh, this, this budget uh, ha is partially private and partially public. So we can see that there are some, not only public institutions, but also private companies that are interested and see the, the potential of this kind of initiatives. <clears throat> the project took uh, nearly three years, from 2017 and, and finishing this year, in 2019. And the scope of the project included, included several, several different use cases, which cover different transport domains connect uh, vehicle traffic, port logistic, airport passenger flows, uh, high-speed uh, rail, connected cars, distribution logistics, and urban mobility. And it's been in three of those use cases that our big data and advanced analytics division in Minsight has contributed. Those use cases are first, the first one uh, is focused on traffic vehicle vehicle traffic prediction, and took a look at two toll roads, one in Malaga, another one in Porto. The second use case uh, was focused on uh, railway maintenance, and it took a look at the high-speed network that connected the Spanish cities of Malaga and Córdoba. <coughs> and the last one pretended to analyze the flow of passengers in the uh, airport of Athens in Greece. <laughs> but in order to, to do our magic as data scientists, we needed some computing, pla some computing platform in order to, to work. And we use a one site open platform, which is a big data distribution that has been developed by Minsight that has a strong open community behind that covered everything we needed because it includes uh, components from the data ingestion and storage to a powerful artificial intelligence and machine learning engine in order to, for us, the data scientists, to do the dirty work. And also included a set of layers for visualization, amplification, and productivization that, that help us uh, very much in order to integrate our results with the external partners that for, uh, form the consortium. But just the platform itself could do nothing because, as Pablo Picasso said, computers are useless because they can just give us the answers. But we need to find the proper questions. And it's this question and answer thing that inspired uh, our unit in order to create a methodology to get the best results when we face an analytical problem. This methodology, just as the video that I showed you at the introduction, is focused on finding the key people that affects a process. Because finding these key people will allow us to get the key knowledge in order to face the problem. This knowledge involves data, because we must know which data is available, the amount of historical data, and the quality of this data, so we can establish which questions can be solved and can be answered, and in which way we can fix the expectations. And also, we can use this knowledge in order to create and establish a set of metrics that allow us to evaluate in an objective way whether the project was successful or not. Once we've done all this, study, this previous study, 
we are now ready to identify and list a set of opportunities that are relevant to the project, and then we can prioritize and create a roadmap in order to get the highest value at the lowest time. So it is uh, following that this methodology that we carry out the developments that are inside this project. And now, allow me to introduce my colleague, David, that will be sharing his experience with the Smart Hydros use case. Thank you. Well, thank you, Victor. <clears throat> now, imagine yourself in the following driving situations. When you go to, to work in the, in the morning and come back home in the evening, when you are on holidays and go to the beach, to the mountains, or wherever you prefer, when you out, go out with your friends to have dinner and come back late at night, or when you have to drive in a rainy day. You know that these road traffic situations are different one from each other, and we have seen only four, but there are many more. And this is the goal of this use case. Model road traffic situations in order to enhance toll road operations. Toll roads that are placed in Porto and Malaga. We had to predict road traffic flows within the next 15 minutes, one hour, and two hours. And also the probability of having an accident within the same time periods. We use for that our knowledge about road traffic dependencies, which are mainly the calendar, the location of the road, and the segments of the road, the hour in the day, the parameters of the road, such as the number of lanes or the width of the road, the number of vehicles that are in the same place of the road at the same time, and the weather conditions. And we face here a problem, and it's that humans are not rational at the wheel. So probably we didn't have the most important feature, which is what drivers are thinking at each moment. But uh, despite of that, we achieve really good results, as you will see. For the road traffic prediction model, we started analyzing historical, historical traffic flows. Uh, both Porto and Malaga has production systems that are recording every 15 minutes the number of vehicles that have passed through each segment of the road. This is done thanks to electromagnetic, electromagnetic induction. When a vehicle passes uh, above a coil that is placed uh, in the asphalt, this vehicle is counted. And this, those are the squares that you can see in the roads when, when you are driving. Um, we use this data, we group by segment, by month, and by hours, and we took the, we analyzed the peak hours of the days, for example, the nine o'clock in the morning or the six o'clock in the evening, and we identified some outliers. These outliers let us know what's the behavior of the roads, for example, in Porto, uh, Porto's road is a road used mainly by people that goes to work. So we only had to, to cluster data in two clusters, one for non-working days and the other one for working days. But in Malaga, uh, as uh, the road is placed in an environmental, uh, in a vacational environment, uh, for example, there, there is the beach, uh, natural parks, and cities around, we had to make up to six clusters because uh, this road was used b uh, by people that goes to work, but also by people that are on holiday. In order to, to assure that and the cluster were well made, we, made, we performed an analysis of variance within each cluster to, in order to assure that the days that were in the same cluster were, uh, behaved the, the same way. All this data was enriched by previous traffic flow rates. These previous traffic flow rates let us know if a bottleneck is coming. And then we try and evaluate uh, models that are related to the this use case. Uh, those are regression models and uh, time series models. For the regression models, we, we tried SBRs, XGBoost, uh, random forests, etc. And for the time series models, we tried LSTMs and ARIMAs. And we obtained that the best model is a random forest, which gave us a relative root mean square error from 15% to 33%, uh, obtaining eight vehicles of error uh, at some segments of the roads during the peak hours, which is a very good error. Uh, 
we, uh, we could achieve good predictions for two hour horizons, which for example, Arimas didn't let, because Arimas were, were good predicting up to one hour, but then uh, the performance uh, decreased. We could achieve near real time predictions, because this model uh, predicts really quick, um, but also because it's in a production system developed by Indra. Um, and it's, this is a, a really important fact, really important fact, because operators need to know as soon as possible how traffic is going to behave in order to optimize the resources, both technical and human. For example, relocating people uh, in different places of the road or opening or closing gates uh, at the toll plazas. All of this uh, has uh, reduced travel time for users <coughs> and their driving experience has, has been improved. For the accidents prediction model, we started analyzing accident reports. Uh, these reports are independent from Porto and from Malaga, and um, we extract from these reports the main variables that we know that have impact in, in accidents generation. Those are uh, the level of service, which is a measure that combines the number of vehicles that are in the road in the same place and the parameters of the road uh, in those places. The location of each segment of the road, the hour in the day, the calendar and the weather conditions. We obtain the probability of having an accident because of, one, uh, because of each of these variables and we concluded that the ones that have the, the most impact are level of service and location followed by the hour in the day and the calendar. And finally, and surprisingly, uh, weather conditions, specifically the rain, didn't have uh, too much impact. But uh, probably this uh, study is biased because we analyze it in Malaga, and it's a place where um, there are few rainy days, so it should be performed again in a city like Madrid where there are more rainy days. In order to combine all these variables, we perform a conditional probability model. This combination let us know what, uh, what's the, le uh, the level of alert of accident in each part of the road. And now you may be asking yourself how accidents can be predicted, because all we have seen here is a descriptive analysis. Well, um, you can see here static variables, which are uh, the parameters of the road, the location, the time and the calendar, but also dynamic variables, which are the weather conditions that we know in advance thanks to weather stations and the level of service, which is known in advance thanks to our road traffic prediction model. So model integration uh, is really important here, and both of them are integrated in the production system I told you before. And we'll, with all of this uh, model, with this model, Operators can warn drivers if they are driving in a, in a segment of road with high probability of having an accident. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, David. And I recommend you to write down his contact information in order you may find a traffic accident when you go back home, back home tonight. <laughs> and now allow me to introduce you, Marta, that will be sharing with us her experiences in both the the railway traffic maintenance and the airport passenger flow. Okay, thank you, Victor. <coughs> well, currently, there are two main strategies for maintaining the railway infrastructures. Corrective maintenance, which consists of repairing the breaks down that have already happened, and preventive maintenance, in which periodically some tasks are performed. The problem with this too is that while corrective maintenance could be too late in time because the fault has already occurred and maybe the service was interrupted, preventive maintenance could be too early and it will be increasing the maintenance cost by performing tasks that were not needed at that moment of time. So um, which was the objective of this use case? Well, predicting when and where the fault will occur. And by achieving this, we will be increasing the network availability, decreasing the maintenance cost, and improving the maintenance efficiency. 
This project focuses on two critical elements of the track, so point machines that are the elements that allow the train to change from one track to another, and the track itself. And to do so, we had information from the track, so dynamic and geometric auscultation of the track, the track geometry, maintenance tasks performed on point machines, the movement times of the point machines, mechanical characteristics of point machines, the events that happen on the track, and the weather conditions. And which challenges did we face during this project? Well, the first one was that not all the data was digitalized in the way that we needed to, and thanks to the fact that MinSight has several digital capabilities, we were able to digitalize it in the way that we needed to. Then it happened to be that one of the main sources of information for the degradation of track profiles came from the dynamic auscultation. And it was not only a time series, but also a signal, and so we had to treat it in the frequency domain. The third was a consequence of the second because we had like a huge number of variables and we needed to reject them. So the most impressive rejection came from applying a PCA in which we went from like 800 variables to just 10, keeping a 98% of information. The fourth is quite common in predictive maintenance problems and it's the fact that the number of no faults was extremely higher in relation with the number of faults. And how do we handle this? Well, we apply a means in order to reduce the number of no faults while keeping our representative simple. And the last one, it was that not all the data cover the same time segment, and it was quite critical for the second objective um, predicting the degradation of point machines, as we will see later. Okay, here you have a summary of the methodology follow for the first objective predicting the degradation of track profiles. And the first thing that we did was divide the track into 200 meter segments, and then applying this segmentation, um, we build the historical data lake, then apply the variable reduction process that I've already mentioned, and then try different models, like train sample models, support vector machines, and neural network. And we gave the results of the score and the confusing matrix to our business partners, so they could decide which model adjusted better to their needs. And um, the final one, the selected one, was the neural network, and here you can see part of the results. So we achieved a accuracy of over 85%, and we wanted to highlight the true positives and false negatives, so you could also see how accurate our model was in order to predict the fault no fault and the severity of, of it. Well, currently, this integrates into real time, so we are already reducing the maintenance cost. For the second objective, predicting the degradation of point machines, the methodology was more or less the same, but the results weren't as good because, as I mentioned before, not all the data cover the same time segments. And what is the real impact of all of this? Well, the maintenance cost had been reduced by almost 35%, uh, the number of interventions per month had also been reduced by like 15%, and the pollution emissions had also been reduced between 15 and 25%. And that it's all real. Okay, so this is the last use case that we're going to talk about, and I will ask you just to keep in mind that at first, it was only an airport initiative, and thanks to the good results, the shops from the airport wanted to be involved. So just wait and see. Okay, here we see what we all do when we're going somewhere. So basically, check in, pass through security, board the flight, and then the flight just takes off. Um, this project um, is focused on um, two stages. So predict the arrival at the security check and understanding the behavior of passengers between the um, shop and the um, security check and the boarding time which is also known as dual time. And to do so, we had information from the airport, from two local airlines, Asian Airlines and Olympic Airlines, and from the shops of the airport. Well, for the first objective, predict the arrival of the security check, uh, we combined several approaches, and the first thing was finding 
a probability distribution for each type of passenger. Uh, we had four groups, so three from the airlines from which we had data, and the fourth covering the rest of the airlines. Having this probability distribution, we had a probability model for the next day ahead, and then applying machine learning techniques, we could improve the first hour ahead. So with combining all of these, at the end of the day, here we have uh, an example, and what we see is that the prediction like captures the most important changes from the real data. And just imagine how useful this is for the airport in order to adjust the number of people needed in the security check. Okay, so now we know how long the passenger is going to stay inside the airport, and the next question is like, okay, so what variables affect the shopping rate the most? So for the shopping rate, we had like one and zero. So one, if any purchase was done, and zero, if the passenger didn't buy anything. On previous studies, it has been seen that the variable that affected the shopping rate the most was the boarding gate. However, in this new study, some relationships between variables has been seen. Like for instance, normally all the flights going to the same destination have the same boarding gate assigned. And so we wanted to order all these variables and so all features the decision tree. And the result was that the variable that affects the shopping rate the most is the type of airline, followed by the part of time, the destination, and finally, the boarding gate. And just to give you some numbers, um, the maximum global shopping rate was like 15%, and the fact that the airline was considered as low, it could change the um, shopping rate uh, twice, and the fact that the boarding gate was from a group of boarding gates you could only change it by 1%. So that's shocking, right? Okay, so what do we know at this point? We know how long the passenger is going to stay inside the airport, we know the variables that affect the shopping rate the most, and the last question to be answered will be like, okay, so in which segment of time the shopping rate is the highest? And to answer this question, we had the distribution of dual time and what we see here is that only 2% of passengers leave 15 minutes between the security check and the boarding time. And normally the rest of us live between like 45 minutes and one hour 15 before the boarding time. Um, then in the same segmentation, we have the, um, the shopping rate. And what we see is that it grows until like one hour and 45. And then no matter how long, the passenger stays inside the airport, that the shopping rate will not be increased. And if you remember the numbers that I've just told you, that the maximum global shopping rate was like 15%, well, here we see that it's lower, and this is because for this study, only data from local airlines has been considered, and normally, when we travel locally, we tend to shop less than we were traveling abroad. Okay, so just a quick recap from all um, what we study is that we have a model that can help the way security check personal management is done. We know the variables that affect the shopping rate most. We know in which segment of time the shopping rate is the highest. And knowing this, some strategies can be implemented in order to have the passengers wait until that time. And now Victor will give you the conclusions. Okay, thank you very much, Marta. <clears throat> so, as my colleagues just said, the project results were quite good and they are all integrated in real-time management systems and exploited by the different partners of the consortium. However, uh, I want to dive a, bit, a little bit more into, this, uh, into the conclusions that we, that we got to. The thing is not just about the, the numbers, because something that we found is that there's still a, a bit of work that has to be done in the uh, cultural change in the sector of data and analytics in this industry. Because sometimes the expectations were different than the results that could be obtained. For example, the, we had the expectation in the vehicle traffic use case that the rain would have a huge impact on accidents 
but we didn't have historical data or significant historical data of rainy days, so we couldn't establish whether it has a real impact or not. Or for example, in the case of the train network maintenance, we didn't have enough data for the point machines to, to be correlated in the same segment time, so we, could, we couldn't carry out a, a real good analysis. So first of all, we need to do is uh, instructing and teaching or this industry that depending on the data that we have, the results will, will be very different, okay? <coughs> Okay, and now uh, going back to the question things that I mentioned before with Pablo Picasso, I just wanted to list which questions we answered along the project. For the first use case, we answered whether we could do something in order to predict vehicle traffic behavior. And we also were asking whether we could uh, do something in order to avoid traffic accidents from happening. In the case of the train network maintenance, we were asking whether we could do something in order to reduce maintenance cost and also guarantee that this maintenance has a fewer uh, greenhouse emissions and also a fewer impact on service level that the final clients would experience. And in the case of the airport use case, we, we were asking whether we could do something in order to properly schedule the personnel that would be working at the security check uh, point at the airport, so we could avoid these long queues that I am I'm sure that you will f have found in sometimes at the airport. No? And also, there was a, a very important question that, as, mentioned, as Marta mentioned, wasn't initially contemplated in the project, but the success of the first anal analysis made the duty-free subs to, to get into the project and ask this question, no? can I do something in order to predict the shopping behavior of the passengers that are coming today to the airport? Well, the answer to all those questions was a huge yes. We could, uh, we could do something in all of those cases. And by that, we have proven the viability and the benefit that the transport industry can have by the application of big data and advanced analytics, but also we have seen that, that those results prove that this can also have a very positive and meaningful impact on society as, as citizens that will have a different experience when you, when, you, uh, when you do something related to transport. And I can conclude the presentation without thanking and introducing some other colleagues that helped us uh, along the project and that are here with us today. Paula, Bea, Santiago, Maria, the three of us, and of course the rest of our data science and artificial intelligence tribe that help us each other every way and share good and bad moments. No? And now uh, we will be answering your question in case you have any. And just before finishing, just wanted to emphasize that the application of big data analytics is not only relevant for transport industry. Uh, regardless the sector of your company, you better apply them now because otherwise you may get a disadvantage, comp uh, a competitive disadvantage. So hurry up because the time is now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> <laughs> so, any question? No, Cesar? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you.